Citata Spirit. This cute little creation is a low-floor, articulated light rail vehicle that was developed by Alstom specifically for Ottawa's O-Train, a light metro transit system in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And on paper, they should have been fine. These are very recent trains, entering service on September 14th, 2019. Depending on their configuration, they have room for up to 370 passengers and are capable of traveling about 56 miles per hour or 90 kilometers per hour. The first order went to Ottawa, of course, but a second order actually went through to the government of Ontario's Metrolinx Transit Agency. As it stands, 38 have been built and 95 are currently under construction. So this is a very current train, not so much historical. What's wrong with it? Right now, it appears to be mostly everything. The first issue that cropped up was the doors. It was found the automated doors on the vehicles that many EMUs or DMUs or really any subway or metro train setup uses would actually experience severe faults if they were pried open or held back by passengers. Now when you say it out loud it sounds like it's the passenger's fault and true. Also, for those of you who have ridden on subways or metros before, how many times have you seen someone hold open a door for somebody? How often do people do that? The spirits can't deal with that apparently even though it's such a common thing and they only got worse from there. Their onboard computer systems had integration issues with the train control system that the railways were using. And you think they would have checked to make sure their systems were compatible with the trains before actually buying them? I feel like somebody really screwed that up. It's just a, just a thing to, to mention. After those issues were resolved, though, reliability improved until November and December of 2019 when electrical problems started cropping up due to improperly cleaned electrical contacts which is not necessarily the train's fault. But then, throughout January 2020, the trains kept failing, and it turned out that our onboard heating systems actually weren't good enough to combat Ottawa's sub-zero winter temperatures. And I know I said this last time, but I feel like I keep having to say it now. It gets cold in Canada. And you should probably make sure that your trains, if they are being sent there, can handle the cold, because they're gonna run into it. By January 30th, 2020, Metrolinx's Confederation line where the Spirits were operating was actually at an all-time operational low because they were short five trains specifically due to these. And that wasn't all. By July 2nd, 2020, they found that cracks were forming in some of the wheels. Upon investigating this, it was found that an improperly aligned screw in the design of the Spirits was actually causing extra stress on the wheels, resulting in the cracks. Alstom said they would fix this, but then on August 8th, 2021, an out-of-service train derailed because a single wheel just came off the tracks while it was crossing a switch. And when they looked into it, they found that the fault within the axle bearing assembly was probably the cause of the derailment. My point is the spirits, right now as it stands, are just the worst. They're not doing at all what they're supposed to be doing. There's teething problems, and then there's just not working. And it seems like these are in the not working category, if you ask me. But it's still early, and it's possible Alstom can fix them and make them actually function, but it's clearly going to take some time because they keep running into issues. The British Rail Class 07. I am neither happy nor sad, neither angry nor hurt. I feel nothing for you. It's just the way it is. I am a hollow, emotionless being. And you destroyed me. It's it's a thing you've done. I just I just need you to know that. The Class 07s are a diesel electric locomotive that were built by Ruston and Hornsby in 1962, specifically for the southern region of British Railways. There were 14 in total made. In their defense, they weren't the worst things British Rail ever used. But they had a recurring problem that at no point was resolved during their time and it had to do with their axle boxes. The Class 07s were actually pretty fast for shunting diesels, which is what they were. They could travel up to 27.5 miles per hour, or 44.3 kilometers per hour, and it was thought they could possibly do some main line work that way, but this was impossible because the axle boxes always ran hot when traveling at high speed. This issue kept cropping up no matter what they did, and it actually made moving them around to different yards very difficult. Normally, shunter classes would have their side rods removed and traction motors isolated and would just be attached to a regular train that was heading in the direction they had to go to be useful. 
But the 07s could never be transferred this way, they always had to go by road, which made a ton of extra work. And even in regular operation, the axle boxes had a habit of overheating. It made them very difficult to work with, and ultimately they could only ever be used at the Southampton docks or the East Sly Works. When they were kept at low speed in those areas, and they didn't even bother trying to move them around, they were alright, they could do the job, but their inflexibility really sealed the deal on them, and they were withdrawn between 1973 and 1977. Though, interestingly, they actually got quite a bit of preservation, probably because, at the end of the day, they are cute-looking diesels. And in preservation, moving at low speeds, just helping to shunt things around, they're actually kind of useful in that regard. Seven of them wound up preserved in various places around the UK. You can actually still see this locomotive if you want to, but just make sure they don't run them at very high speed, otherwise they'll become hotter than the sun. The BN Holek Electrical Rail Train. Hey look, it's Inca again! Didn't we talk about these guys before? This is another Indonesian EMU, and they're also known as the EA-101s. They were produced between 1994 and 2001, and they actually started operating in 1994, and then were withdrawn by 2014, and I bet you're wondering, why? Well, part of their problem is that they run on AC current, not DC, which most of the rail lines in Indonesia are apparently set up for. This issue meant that they required a DC to AC voltage inverter. And even with that installed, they still suffered frequent breakdowns due to other reliability issues. But their biggest problem was actually overload. They were sometimes too heavy to run effectively, sometimes even causing derailments. The reason for this is actually twofold. For one thing, they were made of very heavy components, that in itself wouldn't be a big deal, if not for the fact that when at full capacity, it suddenly inhibited them. Even though there was technically room for everybody on the train, they still had problems when they had too many people on board. This problem only got worse as a result of people riding illegally, traveling on the roof, or hanging from the door. Now, people are not supposed to do this, but other trains on the network could have people do this and still be able to move around effectively. The Holux were never able to handle that, and that on top of their reliability issues made them way more of a headache than it was ever worth dealing with. However, many of the units actually wound up converted into other locomotives, such as KRDEs or Holex ACKRLs. So while in their original form they were atrocious, they did find a new lease on life later. So I guess it wasn't a complete waste. The New South Wales 41-class locomotive. Built by British Thompson Euston between 1953 and 1954, they only produced 10 of them, but these diesel electrics became infamous for being just impossible to work with. From the very beginning, they suffered failures including overheating and, you know, fires. I, that's totally reasonable. Why would you ever not test a locomotive to make sure it doesn't burst into flame? I just feel like that's one key factor that should always be avoided, and yet on these lists I always seem to find these locomotives that were notorious for trying to become a pillar of unquenchable fire. The problem appeared to be in the radiators, and they were relocated further to the ends of all ten of locomotives, and the air ducts were modified. Even with that problem remedied, the Paxman 12-RPHL engines they were using never really worked that well, and when it came time to possibly replace them, it was found that it was cheaper to actually just invest in brand new Class 48s, so they did that instead. Incredibly, one did get preserved. In December of 1976, 4102 was placed by the Public Transport Commission in the custody of the NSW Rail Museum, and it's now considered an NSW heritage item. They actually used it a little bit in service for a while, until one of its engines failed. Then they used it as a one-engine shunter until the batteries wore out in 1987, and then it pretty much went into storage and stayed there, because it's just not worth it anymore. Even in preservation, you find a way to disappoint us. Why are you this way, Class 41? The New Zealand DL Class Locomotive. Okay, I hope you all are sitting comfortably, because this is a complicated tale of some terrible decision-making by Kiwi Rail. In the early 2000s, there was a lot of back and forth between management of New Zealand's rails changing hands from Transrail to Toll Holdings, and the negotiations with the New Zealand Railways Corporation, and a whole bunch of government and corporate jargon that I do not have time to get into, but the point is this. The issue they wound up with was that they needed new diesels. They didn't want to wait too long to get them, and by the time anyone was ready to order them, Kiwi Rail was in charge. The debate was whether or not to import new diesels or make new diesels in New Zealand. Critics of the latter 
were concerned that there just wasn't enough capable labor within New Zealand to actually produce their own diesels. They would have to import. Problem was time. They wanted these diesels fast. And whenever you want something very quickly, you either have to purchase an already pre-existing product, or if you really want something exclusive just for you, and you want it slapped together, it ain't gonna be something that's gonna be very nice. They toyed with the idea of possibly contracting EMD, but they wanted it fast, and EMD has, like, quality control. So instead, they use CRRC Dalian Company. Sometimes abbreviated as D-Loco. What is that? Have you ever heard of it before? They're a Chinese company. Now, China has produced decent diesels before. Let's not say anything against China in particular. But in this instance, the DL classes did not turn out to be great at all. They are technically still in service as of now. But from the get-go, they had a lot of enemies. There were a ton of union issues with these things, saying that they were unsafe. That part is probably a little bit untrue, as they were worried about visibility. And I can tell you, looking at them, look, there's big windows right in the front of it. The driver can see, all right? That's not really an issue with these. What was more of an issue is that they simply didn't work. Technical problems with a wide variety of their internal components were all over the place. Kiwi Rail insists to this day, that these teething problems were normal, and that reliability was improving, which is really funny, because a more recent article from the 11th of June 2020 looked further into this, and uh, no, no, they haven't improved. They're still pretty terrible, actually. And Kiwi Rail wants to buy more. That is also not mentioning the fact that asbestos was found in a few of them. Oh yes, really. You know, we live in the 21st century, and I think for the most part we understand that asbestos is bad, and you shouldn't put it in anything. Apparently the Chinese manufacturers didn't get the memo, because in a resin used for the soundproofing within the locomotives, some asbestos was found. Now to be fair, this was a little overblown, as the amount they found was minimal. None of it was airborne, none of it was in dust form, it really was insignificant. But the point is, it was still there, and it shouldn't have been there at all. Oh yes, another early problem that they had is that the alternator fan tended to fail, and by fail, I mean the blade would break off and threaten to impale anyone standing near it. The instructions given to the Kiwi Rail employees were simply not to enter the alternator compartment and to keep the doors shut when the engine was running. Because that'll solve that problem. I mean, it'll keep them from getting impaled, but I think you're missing the point, Kiwi. These diesels are not good. And they're still not good. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Are you taking some pages out of British Rail's playbook? Did you like getting these bad diesels? No, I take that back. I can't compare this to British Rail, because at least British Rail, when they got a bunch of bad diesels, had the good sense to give up on them and replace them with better ones. You guys are sticking to your guns with these DLs, and I'm not sure that's a great idea. But maybe they'll get better. Maybe they will. But I'm not going to hold my breath on this. The Montreal Locomotive Works RSC-24, constructed between March and April of 1959, only four of these stubby little diesel electrics were produced for the Canadian National Railway. They used the 12-cylinder 244 diesel engine. The engines were actually derated to only 1,400 horsepower. This was to make the locomotive suitable for weight-restricted light rail duties. They also used three-axle trucks to try to spread their weight out, again, to make them more suitable for light rail duties. This meant they had less traction, and that was part of the reason why the engines were derated. They were actually very unique locomotives. They were designed to replace 260 and 460 steam locomotives in eastern Canada, but they never really worked very well, and it was down to their engines, the Model 244. They just never worked reliably. There were always issues with them, and they were never resolved at any point. The engines trucked along till the mid-70s, but by that point, Canadian National had had just about enough of them and decided to scrap all four engines. The CAF Urbos 3. I actually had someone call me out on talking about things like streetcars and trams because they're not like full-size trains, but they're still trains. Like... They're still running on rails, I think they're totally fair game for this series. So, you know, fight me I guess. But as you can see the Urbos 3, in fact the entire Urbos line, is a modern style trolley or tram or streetcar, whatever you want to call it, designed to operate very short regional services. What the CAF stands for? Well that's the manufacturer, which is... Oh dear. Okay, I only promised to try. 
Construcciones y Auxiliar de Ferrocarriles. I don't know how close I was. I, I gave it a shot. I am so sorry if I butchered that. We're just going to call them CAF this whole time. Or CAF. Now, the Airbus line overall has seen a lot of success. They were decent trams. That was until the Airbus 3. The 3 is currently undergoing some major, major, major problems. That it seems that every railway that's incorporated them is experiencing. On the surface, they actually had a lot of potential. CAF has the option to allow them to operate off of a lithium-ion battery, so they can actually operate on non-electrified lines for a limited amount of time, which is kind of cool. Depending on the, each unit's total length, they can seat up to 327 people, and travel upwards of 50 miles an hour, or 80 kilometers an hour in certain places. But like I said, they're flawed. The first ones to discover it was the Bessicon Tranway in Bessicon, France. The Airbo 3s had cracks around the bogey box area of their bodies. This was in 2017, and CAF would eventually pay for the remedial work to be done, but over time, other railways, like West Midlands Metro and the Sydney L1 Dulwich Hill Line in New South Wales, also discovered the same exact problem. The units were cracking. Repeatedly over and over and over again. This is a rather recent development, with some of the problems actually being discovered just last year. So it's hard to say what the future holds for the Urbos 3, but as of right now, it's not looking too good. Many of the lines had to be closed down entirely because they were reliant on these Urbos units, and they can't be used because it's too dangerous. The cracking could easily get worse and cause an accident. We can't risk that, obviously. The Milwaukee Road Class EP-3. Not to be confused with the EP-2, they look nothing alike. While the EP-2s were great and built by General Electric, the EP-3s were built by Baldwin and Westinghouse. They were actually nicknamed quills because they used a quill drive. It's a mechanism that allows a drive shaft to shift its position relative to its driving shaft. It sounds weird, but it's seen success. In fact, the system was used incredibly effectively on the GG-1. From that, it could be suggested that the EP-3s must have been really good, right? Built in 1919, 10 of them were put together, they were big, powerful, with a maximum speed of 65 miles per hour, or 105 kilometers an hour. Well, they're on this list, so you know how this is going to go. They didn't work out so good. Even though they were virtually identical to New Haven's successful EP-2s, yes, they were also called EP-2s, this is getting very confusing, I agree. Not Milwaukee Road's EP-2s, New Haven's EP-2s, Totally different, and the EP-2s from New Haven are somewhat identical to the EP-3s from Milwaukee Road. Ooh! However, there were some differences. Milwaukee Road's EP-3s were heavier, while also having a more lightly built frame. This was a really bad design choice, as they started experiencing broken axles and frame members. Their wheels and spokes started cracking, and they had deformed suspension springs. Upon investigation, Westinghouse was very embarrassed, as they had simply designed the locomotive bodies not to be strong enough to withstand how heavy they were. There was also very little lateral play in the drivers themselves, and this caused the wheels to wear out very quickly, and the frames kept breaking due to the stress of high-speed operation. They did attempt to make some changes. Baldwin actually recommended they split them in two to make them permanently couple two unit box cabs, and they tried that experiment with one of them, and it didn't help. Milwaukee Road conducted their own design changes, using heavier steel for the frames, as well as new trucks that could help guide the locomotives on curves. So they worked a lot better after those fixes, but even then they never really met the standards. Milwaukee Road's mechanical department had to rebuild them five times during their service lives, which is way too many times, and they were also prone to derailing, which great, that was good too. After World War II, when Milwaukee Road looked at refurbishing all their electric locomotives for continued service, the quills weren't included in that program. Out of the ten of them, three had actually already been retired due to wrecks, and the other seven were all scrapped by 1957. The Victorian Railways W Class this group of 27 tiny, tiny, adorable diesel hydraulic locomotives were shunters that were built by Tulock Limited for Victorian Railways in Australia. And as much as I think they're cute, and as nice as they look, I gotta be honest with you, these things are complete pieces of junk! And I hate that! 
I hate having to say it, because I really like how they look. They kind of remind me of the teddy bear. But unlike the teddy bear, these things were terrible. As shunters, they were slow, which is normal. They've got a maximum speed of 32 kilometers an hour, or only 20 miles per hour. But for their job, that's totally fine. What wasn't fine was their engines. Their V12 diesel engines were absolute, absolute garbage. Completely useless. Crews hated these little things so much. They had poor ride quality already, but generally it's possible to get over that if they worked. They didn't. Their engines failed constantly, and sometimes Victorian Railways wanted them to work on the main line. But in order to do that, they needed a transmission change because, by default, they were simply too slow. Their high gear setting was removed early on, but even as shunters, they really weren't that good. Their cab profile made visibility difficult, and the crews had to lean out of the side, as if they were working a steam locomotive, in order to observe shunting instructions, which kind of defeated the purpose of utilizing a modern diesel, don't you think? Oh, their transmission seized. That happened too. And they also suffered oil leaks onto their steps, which created a slip hazard. And their engine blocks failed. That too. That happened too. A lot went wrong on these, is what I'm trying to say. They first ran in 1959, and by the mid-70s, Victorian Railways thought maybe now's about a good time to try to address this thing's problems. At least ten of the engines had their Mercedes V12s removed and replaced with General Motors diesel units. This made them work a bit better, but they still really weren't that much fun for the crews to work on due to the ride quality and overall conditions of the cab. Perhaps due to their nature as teeny tiny diesels, five of them actually wound up in preservation. Since, you know, small diesels are really good for heritage railways, and I totally get that. The remaining 22 were all scrapped. Because, no. The Aero Wagon, or Aeromoto Wagon. <laughs> really? We're gonna do this again, are we? I thought we already talked about this. The Sheen and Zeppelin already kind of revealed the problem with this uh, relative idea. Though, to be fair, this actually predates the Sheen and Zeppelin. This one was constructed in Russia in 1917. Only one was put together, and it was invented by a man named Valerian Abakovsky. He was a Soviet engineer from Latvia, and much like they were trying to do with the Sheen and Zeppelin, Abakovsky wanted to combine the elements of an aircraft with a train. The result was the railcar Aerowagon, which despite looking kind of rickety if I'm being honest, and alarming in that regard, the Aerowagon was actually really fast, especially in those days. It could reach 140 kilometers per hour, or 87 miles per hour, which was impressive for 1917. The propeller worked in terms of providing a very fast method of drive. It's just, it's a propeller on the ground. Next to people. They're right there. There's nothing about this that's safe, is what I'm trying to say. That's what I've always said when it comes to these propeller-driven railcars. It's simply not a reasonable thing to do. Information is also a bit hard to come by regarding other issues it may have had, though I imagine it would have suffered similar problems to the Sheenan Zeppelin, such as not being able to go backward, or struggling up hills. But its major fault seemed to be a lack of stability because it crashed. Horribly so. It was meant to carry Soviet officials as a much faster method of traveling on the rails, which it could do that, sure. But on the 24th of July, 1921, a group of delegates of the first contras of the Profiturn, which was led by Fyodor Sergeyev, decided to take the aero wagon from Moscow to Tula in order to test it. Abakovsky himself was also on board at the time. Now, the Aero Wagon did get to Tula, and very quickly, but on its way back, it derailed going at very high speed, and this killed six of the 22 people on board, and a seventh died later of his injuries. Among the dead was Valerian Abakovsky himself. He was only 25 years old. The Aero Wagon was never rebuilt after that, although like I said, the Sheenan Zeppelin was also a thing that was attempted, but the point is, it failed. Please stop putting propellers on locomotives. It really just doesn't seem to work that well, is what I'm trying to say. The British Rail Class 31 slash 4. Son of a... <laughs>
The worst part about this is I have no one to blame but myself anymore. It's not even that they keep breaking into my house. I mean, they do. But that's not actually the issue here. I have noticed that every time I don't put British Rail on the list, people are like, where's British Rail? I want to see British Rail. I want to see you get mad about British Rail. Which is funny, because whenever I do do it, I get people saying that I don't want to see British Rail, it's too much. It's not funny anymore. You're not funny. Your videos are terrible, and I don't even know why you're here then. But it's just one of those things where I'm like, I don't even know why I read comments. Welcome to the internet. I should get used to this by now, and I am. But my point is that I know that British Rail has been a meme on this channel since the very beginning. But I'll be real with you, I am running out of genuinely bad locomotives to talk about when it comes to British Rail. Not everything they made was bad, and I can't keep forcing it, and I'm trying to look and find weirder stuff, but there's only so much that's there. And if I run out, well, I can't make things up. This is historical. I have to be factual. But I did find one more this time. And before anyone gets mad, I am not talking about the Class 31 as a whole. Because I'm sure many have pointed out already, and have probably already complained in the comments before even watching the video, because that's usually what happens, that the Class 31 is actually pretty good on its own. It was developed by Brush Traction. They were built between 1957 and 1962. Diesel electric. That time frame suggests they might be bad, but these were, again, one of the ones that came out all right from the modernization plan. They were decent diesels. They were absolutely fine and lasted a quite a long time, actually. The last one wasn't withdrawn until 2017, and 26 are preserved. So, how dare I refer to them as bad? Well, if you were paying attention, I'm referring to the 31-4 derivative of the 31s. These were a subclass beneath them, and they were remodeled with an ETH, an electric train heating system. And as we've been over before, British Rail kind of had a rough period involving ETHs. They were new, and the kinks hadn't been quite worked out yet. And in the 31's case, it was found that the ETH just did not jive with them at all. And this was mostly down to power output. The 31's, for all their good traits, were always considered a little bit underpowered. Not enough to be a real problem, but they weren't as strong as a lot of the other diesels that British Rail had. As a result, many of their trains that they did pull were shorter than a lot of the bigger expresses. That was fine, though. They still had use for them. However, when the ETH was installed, it just completely wrecked their electric power output. The index for the models they installed was 66, which is equivalent to about 330 kilowatts. That is one-third of the total electrical output of the locomotives, leaving only two-thirds for actually pulling stuff. As a result, actually utilizing them when it came to the ETH and pulling things at the same time was not really something they were any good at. Any train they did pull had to be really short, not exceeding four, maybe five carriages tops. Does that make them the absolute worst? No, I put them in spot five on this list for a reason, but the 31 slash fours were not really viewed as a particularly major success, simply because the 31s were just never designed with the ETH in mind, and it was one of those modifications that just didn't go really well. But like I said, in other aspects, they did all right, and served for a great deal of time, as their reliability was quite good. So, outside of the Slash 4 variants, I would comfortably put the rest of the 31s on best trains ever, to be frank with you. Kinda stands as another case of just how easily you can ruin a perfectly good locomotive. The DR Class 119. Behold, the product of communist oversight. The 119s were an East German Deutsche Reichsbahn diesel locomotive, and they were built in Romania. They were technically a development of the successful 118s, and interestingly, I feel like I'm talking about ETH a lot lately, because in the 1970s, the DR needed a locomotive with ETH in mind. Additionally, they wanted an axle load of under 16 tons, and a power output of over 2,000 horsepower. These requirements were actually difficult to address, 
Due to certain political agreements, the East German economy actually wasn't allowed to build a diesel locomotive that was more than 1,500 horsepower, and the locomotive producers of the Soviet Union could only supply heavy engines. That's why they wound up being built by the 23rd August Locomotive Works in Romania, while the actual power units, the engines themselves, were produced by East Germany. Though the Romanians actually never did install those engines due to some coordination problems, and that part had to be done by a West German manufacturer, MTU. 200 of these diesels were produced between 1976 and 1985, but they were plagued with problems from the start. Up to 50% of the locomotives were in workshops at any given time, and it was mostly due to the engines themselves. And one of their nicknames was actually Karpetenschreck, which means Carpathian Terror, relating directly to their problems. They broke on a near constant basis, they just kinda had to work around them. In fact, an unverified story about how they did this involves using like three locomotives on one line. Every time one would get to a station, they'd replace it with an entirely different diesel, specifically because they were concerned that if one diesel did a whole route, it would break. Now that may be a woeful exaggeration, but they were in the workshops a lot because of their problems, and they're legendary as one of the worst German-built diesels ever designed, which is rare for them. Usually, whether it's West or East Germany, if it's a German diesel, it's probably all right. The 119s are the exception. The Renfe Class 340. Goodness, I hope I'm saying Renfe right. Is it Renfe? Renfe? Or just Renf? What are you? It's Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Buenos dias, hola. That's, that's all I got. I can't do anything beyond that. They were built in 1966, and only 32 were ever produced. They were actually based off of the German-built diesel, the Class V200. The V200s were really good diesels, by the way, in their original form, and many countries mimicked their overall design, including British Rail. The Class 42 and 43 were both based off of these as well. However, Renfe's Class 340 outing was... not... great. The V200s had two different diesel engines that put out about 1,000 horsepower apiece. It was a little more than that, but close enough. As a result, the overall output of the locomotive was about 2,000 horsepower. But the Class 340s cranked everything up to 4,000 horsepower. Both engines were doing double the work. Boosting engines in this manner can work out alright, but it's always a risky venture, and usually it results in the need for extra maintenance. The actual Spanish railways that utilize these found that when they were working, they were fine, with a maximum speed of 130 kilometers an hour, or 81 miles per hour, but the more they were used, the more problems cropped up. The maintenance that they were providing the locomotives was not good enough to counterbalance the wear and tear on the engines. The series failed many, 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 many times, overall not being viewed as a particularly successful venture. However, two did wind up preserved, so if you're ever in Spain, you might actually be able to see one of these things. The Pennsylvania Railroad Class K-5. Oh boy, I can't believe how long I've put this off. I've brought the K5 up a handful of times, usually when I talk about the K4s, because, well, the K5s are part of the reason why the K4s stuck around so long. The K4s were great, absolutely awesome, but over time, they needed some kind of replacements. Their power output was not good enough for modern trains. There was open the Penzi having to double or even triple head them sometimes. They had other, larger locomotives that could also do similar work, with less crews involved, but they were never really a proper replacement for the K4s, just a supplement. The K5 was the first real attempt to actually straight up replace the K4s. Two of them were originally built in 1929 for testing. 5698 was built by PRR Altoona Works, and the other, 5699, was built by Baldwin. And they sucked. Oh my goodness, they were terrible! Design-wise, their dimensions were just kind of an enlarged K4. They were still Pacifics like the K4s, but they were bigger, with fatter boilers that were a lot closer to the I-1S 210-0 decapods. Almost everything about them was just an enlarged, bigger K4, and therefore, on paper, they did have much better horsepower. The only exception in terms of their dimensions was the 70-square-foot great area 
and the 80 inch drivers. But you can't just necessarily scale up a locomotive and not expect different results. They had more power, technically sure, but they didn't have that much more weight on their driving wheels. This means that, really, they had no more adhesion than a K4 would. It affected their ability to pull anything, meaning they didn't really outperform the K4s at all. If the train was too heavy, their wheels would slip, which is bad, we don't want that either. The K4s may have needed extra help, but they had good adhesion for what they were working with. The K5s had all the power in the universe, but not enough traction on the rails to actually do anything with it. Both locomotives did actually stick around for a decent amount of time, though. In fact, pretty much until the end of Steam. They weren't retired until 1953. The reason is that, in some other aspects, as long as the train was light enough, the adhesion issue never really cropped up. Like I said, it was pretty much the same as a K4. Now, it's true this meant that their power meant nothing, but as long as the train was something a K4 could also handle, the K5s could do it just fine. So in that vein, they could still pull things on occasion, and be somewhat useful in that regard, but it never convinced the Penzi to actually build any more. Because why would they? They didn't perform any better than the K4s did, even though they were technically more powerful. It just didn't make any sense. The FS-356. What the heck is that thing? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't laugh. Looks like an outhouse on wheels. Or, like, the worst dingiest trailer you could find in your local trailer park. Stick it on a railway. That's what that looks like. And yeah, it looks like something that was slapped together. And, uh, to be fair, that's actually exactly what the 356s are. These were built by Italy during the Second World War, by their state railways, as war locomotives. And I think this really encompasses Italy under Mussolini in the most literal sense. Like, the misguided nature of this design, the woeful ineptitude on display here, that is raw Mussolini. In every aspect. It's just almost beautiful in that regard. However, these were absolutely atrocious. They were meant to be used by the Italian armed forces in Libya, pulling military trains to supply their troops, and they were built using salvaged parts. Literally anything they could get a hold of to put this thing together, that's what they use. Because it was 1942, World War II was raging, they didn't have access to a lot of parts, proper parts, to actually build a locomotive from the ground up. They're diesels, and they only ever built four of these things, thank goodness, uh, because, well, they were terrible in pretty much every category. You could slap together a lot of things for a war effort, and sometimes you wind up with something that's okay. A lot of the war locomotives built by the UK and America were actually pretty good, and in fact, a lot of Germany's were really good. Italy's attempt is uh, not that at all in any real way, Fiat actually slapped these together, and I do literally mean slapped. All four were technically classified the same, but they weren't built the same. 001 and 002 were encased with a completely metal body, which is good, but 003 and 004 used a partially wood construction, which is horrifying. Frankly, we evolved well past the need for wooden locomotives. The transmission actually used a clutch unit with multiple discs that connected to a mechanical gearbox of the Fiat type with four different gears. In theory, they could reach 50 kilometers an hour, which wasn't that fast even in those days, but it's faster than you would expect out of this thing, but they only delivered 230 horsepower, which meant that they could move themselves and really not much else, which is really frustrating because the whole point of them was to move supplies. If they can't pull much, then they're no good for that at all. This resulted in them actually just being despised by the workers on the railway. They weren't very useful, and they just were kind of ugly in pretty much every regard. I think that's been pre-established. As I'm sure you know quite well, Italy did not actually win World War II. Well, I guess in the technical sense they did, because when they deposed Mussolini, they actually switched sides. So they could be on the winning team, I guess. But yeah, it, this was ill-advised, this was terrible, and no, 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 no. 
No. Though amazingly, they actually remained in technical service until 1960. I still can't believe that. They were all scrapped, though. Which might have been very easy, because frankly, they just look like a pile of scrap metal. I'm almost impressed at how much these things just look like trash. The R44, early models. The R44s are New York subway models that were built by the St. Louis Car Company from 1971 to 1973, specifically for the B Division and the Staten Island Railway, or SIR. They were meant to replace the R1s through R9 series of cars, and in some regards they were actually very modern. In fact, they had a state-of-the-art electrical and mechanical system. And, you know, state-of-the-art systems can be very good. After all, we want to push the envelope, we want to get things in the future, and the whole point was to modernize the New York subway. So, having a modern system is totally reasonable. What isn't reasonable is that state-of-the-art systems tend to have some uh, growing pains, some things people just aren't used to. And in this case, the big thing seemed to be down to the brakes. It wasn't that the brakes didn't work, it was that the brakes worked too well. The system was very sensitive to a variety of factors, and what tended to happen was that the brakes would lock, thinking there was an emergency. As a result, the cars refused to move. The brakes were stuck like that for an extended amount of time until they could be released. This, of course, disrupted operations, because, duh. Additionally, there were some safety concerns with the cars, namely involving the blind. In 1983, organizations for the blind stated that the gaps in between the R44 and R46 cars were dangerous, since the blind could apparently mistake the spaces for doorways. They had to go through a redesign phase. It just had to be done, between the brake systems and everything else going on. So a general overhaul program was initiated, and that seemed to have fixed most of their problems. In fact, some are still in service now with the Staten Island Railway, although they are looking at replacing those someday. For all their issues, they stuck around for decades, and for all intents and purposes, they were fixed. A lot of their problems were growing pains, teething troubles, things that could be and were resolved. So, yeah, they were bad, but they're not like that anymore. At least, they're fine now. The CIE-001 class, sometimes called the A-Class. These diesels were manufactured by Metropolitan Vickers at their Dukenfield Works in Manchester, specifically for the Irish State Railways, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. I'm not doing it. You can't make me do anything around here. Look at that. How do you say that? You tell me. If you live outside of Ireland, in fact, I'm convinced even if you live in Ireland, you don't know how to say that properly. There's no way. Diesel electrics, built between 1955 and 1956, they actually served as the backbone of Irish Railway's freight operations for many years. But they didn't start out so hot. In fact, they started out absolutely terrible. Just the worst. The reason? Well, they were mechanically very similar to the British Rail Class 28s. Oh yes! The Kobo! The Kobo has appeared on this list before, for various reasons, because they were awful. And in fact, the 001s also had Crosley engines, too. Those engines really came up when I talked about the Australian's X-Class. The Crosley engines were just not suited for railway operation. They were notorious for problems. And I assure you, the 001s were no exception to this issue. The engines, for one thing, were unbalanced, and that resulted in vibration-induced fuel pipe and water pipe fractures. The cylinders were often defective, which can lead to a whole plethora of issues, and excessive water temperature caused shutdowns constantly. And it made it so that the 001s, despite the fact that the Irish Railways desperately needed them, were a constant pain, a constant nightmare. Never at any point were they functioning properly, until they did actually fix them. In the case of the Kobos, British Rail just kind of gave up on them, and they just didn't use them anymore. In the case of the X-Class, the Australian mechanics actually fiddled with them and constantly repaired all their issues, so they survived a long time that way. Ireland had a different methodology. Well, if the Crosley engines suck so hard, why don't we just get rid of them? A logical maneuver. They replaced them between 1968 and 1971 with EMD 645E engines. Those were insanely good engines. The SD40-2s used engines like these. So replacing the Crosleys with them was a great idea. It didn't go perfectly though, because the cooling systems and transmission systems were left the same, and they weren't suited for EMD's engine. 
but they fixed that problem by throttling the engine down a little bit. The 645E was meant to operate at 1,650 horsepower, but they dropped that to 1,325 horsepower to deal with the limitations of the cooling and transmission systems. This seems to have fixed the problem, and the diesels kept serving in that form until 1995, which is another impressive display. Much like the R44s, these were really bad, but they were given a second chance and repaired. Out of the 60 that were produced, four wound up in preservation. The Tasmanian Government Railways J-Class. Ooh, we're talking about Tasmania. Is there gonna be a devil here? Well, I don't know if you'd call the J-Class a devil. It was actually known as Hagen's Patent. But given its particular parameters being a 2640T, yes, it's an articulated tank locomotive. And for that era, for these rails, for the situation, it was truly Big Chungus. Only one was produced in 1901, and it was, frankly, a complete disaster. It was awful. Not because it didn't work, it did, it functioned. But the rails in that time were very lightly built. They weren't exactly the little solid pieces of work. The engines had to be able to compensate for that and not be too hard on them. And this locomotive didn't give a crap about the rails. It destroyed every line it ran on without mercy and without hesitation. It was horrible. Powerful? Sure, yeah, very much so. But truth be told, the rails it ran on felt more force than the cars it pulled ever did. It did survive almost a decade, believe it or not, because they kind of still needed it, even if they had to repair every single rail it ran on during that time. Eventually, it was replaced in 1910 by the K-Class, and the only model of this locomotive ever built was scrapped. The South African Newton Road Rail Tractors. What in the world did I just say? What is a road rail tractor? What even is that? What am I looking at? Is it a traction engine? Well, sort of? No, not, not really. That would imply they were good. These are road rail steam tractors that were constructed between 1917 and 1924. And the thought was, let's combine the elements of a rail-based steam engine with a steam tractor. You get the benefits of both and none of the downsides, which is a really nice statement, except the end result went the opposite direction. They got all the drawbacks and none of the benefits. They were supposed to help the profitability issue of branch lines in the area at the time, but it didn't really go so well, and they weren't just smaller locomotives. That in itself would make them just steam engines. The reason they were called road rail tractors is that while they were stuck on a rail, their driving wheels were actually on road. Like, they used rubber tires and stuff. It was very strange. The brainchild behind the experiment was Major Frank Dutton, SRA signal engineer and motor transport superintendent. He thought that rubber tire in contact with a hard road would be better at transferring tractive power than a steel wheel on a steel rail. That's probably not wrong in some aspects, but it varies very much. And it was found that he was seriously underestimating the tractive effort power of steel on steel, as many people in those days still did somewhat, while overestimating rubber on road. Because rubber on road is decent at traction, but it's not like it's that much better than steel on steel. I mean, there is a difference, but it wasn't enough to warrant a complete redo of the whole network. At the end of the day, the whole system seemed rather pointless. For one thing, putting it on rails denied the freedom obtained by rubber on road. And it wasn't like it was such attractive effort improvement over the traditional rail network to warrant it. Also, it was a lot slower, too. They last ran in 1927, and every single one of them wound up scrapped. The SLVS Motor Car. Welcome to the San Luis Valley Railway, where they decided to make their own locomotive when they were no, by no means qualified to do so, and they decided on some really weird decision-making processes. Much like with the railroad tractors, they thought, you know, what if we made some of the wheels on this locomotive rubber? And they did. They put rubber tires on this thing between the sets of freight car trucks, specifically to increase traction. And they had a Ford Flathead V8 engine that powered the thing. Needless to say, um, I should probably stress this, this is very important to me. 
This didn't work at all. The rubber tires kept busting open. They weren't built for the weights or the conditions involved with rail operation. The whole thing was sidelined as a switcher, which it kind of was able to do, and then it was finally taken apart. The railroad was reorganized in 1953, and by 1957 they were reduced to just a few miles in the Blanca area, but they weren't done trying to create their own locomotive. This time they made something called the D-500. Instead of using rubber, they didn't do that again, they used a chain. Like on a bike? What? What are you doing? It feels like every design choice they made was counterintuitive to how anybody else was making locomotives. And I don't mind doing things differently. I love the element, I love the spirit here, but it... Well, it worked better than the rubber, won't lie. This one was powered by an international harvester UD24 diesel engine, which drove a Caterpillar hydraulic transmission, which fed into a Euclid truck axle. What? The truck axle was connected to a sprocket, and that turned a double roller chain, which was reduced down to another sprocket that went down onto one of the trucks. The main drive chain drove the wheel, with said wheel also chain driving the wheel on the adjacent truck. What? Why? Everything I just said is way more complicated than it really had to be, but admittedly it did work. Maintenance was not fun on it because there were so many moving parts involved with keeping this system operating, but when it was working, it did work. They got some use out of this weird locomotive. In 1996, they shut down, and the equipment basically sat abandoned. The assets were eventually purchased by the San Luis and Rio Grande Railway in 2007, just to use for car storage, and the two remaining SSLV locomotives were left to rust. In fact, based on my research, it's still there. The D500 is, anyway, just chilling. It's not considered preserved since no one seems to be interested in moving it or putting it anywhere, but I would almost encourage, as weird as it is, I would almost encourage someone to look into possibly preserving it, because it's such a unique piece. Like, I can't think of any other locomotive ever in the history of well, railroading in general, to ever be laid out in such a perplexing way, and for it to actually kind of work. The one before it that used the rubber tires is long gone, but this chain system is apparently still there, so I'd be interested to at least see it, and put it in a place where it doesn't just rust into nothingness. But you'd have to get someone with enough money, and means, and space in order to do that, and um, I live in a two-bedroom apartment, so it's not going to be me. The SJY3. The Y3 was actually a series of rail cars, diesel-powered, that were operated by Staten's Jansvega of Sweden. Six of these were built between 1966 and 1967, and I put them low on the list because they did wind up being fixed in the end, but early on, they weren't uh, very good. They were constructed by Link Hoffman of Germany, with electrical equipment supplied by ASEA. They actually lasted in service until 1990, which was pretty impressive, but the Y3 had a little itsy-bitsy, teensy-weensy problem. See, it was designed to use less powerful Rolls-Royce engines initially, but those were replaced by Deutz diesel engines, which did supply a lot more power, and that was good, but their cooling system was not sufficient for the level of output those engines were producing. And as a result, they had a tendency to catch on fire, which is bad. Very, very, very bad. A little hard to come back from that, but like I said, they fixed them. The cooling system specifically was rebuilt in the 1970s. And after that, they were fine. It was just that initial problem with the, you know, spontaneous combustion, which is a little hard for me to ignore. Like, look, 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 look. Any locomotive, rail car, I don't care what it is. All I ask is it doesn't just burst into flame. I think that's a reasonable standard to have. That's all I'm saying. The Japanese government railways, class 190. Ooh, a Japanese locomotive? I don't think we've had one of these on this particular series before. Though, to be fair, the Japanese didn't actually make these locomotives. These were imported. Two of them were built, number eight and number nine. Dubs and Company of Glasgow, Scotland actually built these locomotives for the Japanese government railways. And they had some uh, interesting design choices. 
you've probably already noticed that they're tank engines, and their water tanks on the sides are really chunky. Some would call them ugly as a result, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but they uh, weren't good. See, um, these locomotives were initially issued to the Japanese with no brakes at all. Now, one would think that that would be kind of a basic necessity regarding any type of locomotive. Can it stop on its own? No. No, they could not. It seems the initial intent of these was to operate in tandem, and the thought was that when going in one direction, the locomotive facing the other way would pull opposite and slow the train down. And sure, but that's not really what the Japanese used them for, or what any logical person would expect them to do, because why would they? These locomotives were not linked together permanently at all. The alternative was that they were supposed to use a brake van, so the engine couldn't load coal on the rear in any way. Coal had to be loaded on the abnormally large side water tanks. Which, that's not, no, 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 that's not how that's supposed to work. And it also requires that these always be linked to a brake van. Now, a brake van system on trains is not unusual. Plenty of railroads use them, but not for, like, just one locomotive. Like, usually that would be for longer trains, when you needed extra braking power in the rear or something. This system was completely alien to the Japanese. They had no experience with it. And as a result, they couldn't really get much use out of 8 or 9 without risking someone dying horribly. They did wind up giving them some upgrades, and that included brakes, which... Th thank you for that. And they actually weren't even originally called Class 190. They were named that in 1909. Originally, they were called Class D, and then later Class A5. Yeah, I know, it's confusing, I agree. And though both were manufactured in 1871, with the upgrades given to them, they did last until 1927. So again, these were ones that were sort of fixed. Santa Fe's 2662 Jointed Boiler Steam Locomotives. What? Wait, it's got a... It's got a what? Why? Well, okay. So this is actually a variant of a Malay articulated locomotive. A flexible coupling was added midway along the length of the boiler casing. This allowed the boiler to bend laterally when the locomotive was on curved track. And if you think about it, that's actually a pretty brilliant concept. On paper, this is great. It makes it so that a steam locomotive, no matter how long the boiler may be, have a much easier time negotiating curves, reducing overhang. Six of these were built for Santa Fe, one by them, while the other five were built by Baldwin. It was thought that it could also reduce track wear, since on curves, the outer rail would have a greater load due to the overhang, and it might have rode better too, but in practice... No, that didn't really work so well. There were two different methods for making the flexible area. One involved a double ball joint assembly, consisting of cast iron sleeves. The other one was a bellows joint, which consisted of several pairs of concentric tapered steel rings, each riveted to its neighbor along alternating inside and outside edges. The ball joints wound up being used more because the bellows method resulted in a lot of, uh, <clears throat> leaks due to coal cinders getting stuck in the folds. But even with the ball joint method, it was still subject to a lot more wear than a solid boiler otherwise would be. Maintenance on them was a Christmas nightmare. And though the engines were powerful enough to stay in service for about 18 years, they, uh, they were all scrapped in the end, and Santa Fe never attempted it again. The Onward! What an interesting, if overzealous, name for a locomotive. What do we have going on here? This is obviously old, and it is. Built in 1887 by the Hinckley Locomotive Works in Boston, specifically for the Swinnerton Locomotive Driving Wheel Company. That company's founder, C.E. Swinnerton, had specified the exact parameters of this particular locomotive. Now, you might look at this and say, ah, it's a 422. Yeah, it probably didn't have very good track adhesion. No, 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 no. You don't understand how bad this was. Okay, on face value, it's pretty much impossible to tell what's really going on here, just looking at the picture. So let me just tell you. 
Do you see the only set of driving wheels? The two? Well, you can only see one of the picture, but you get my meaning. Okay. Swinnerton had specified that the driving wheels should actually, instead of being round, be polygons with 118 sides. Each flat segment was supposed to be 2 inches or 50 millimeters long. He thought that the line contact at the intersection of each segment would have better rail adhesion than a circular wheel. He was wrong. As previously stated, even on its own, that wheel arrangement was not used very often, if ever at this point, because, well, it had poor adhesion. Only two sets of driving wheels just wasn't enough. But the polygonal wheel actually made it worse. To add to the hilarity, since it's not a smooth wheel, and therefore having edges, uh, the vibration made ride quality just hideous. And I can't imagine it would last very long under common service. Wear and tear on that thing had to be awful. Not that it was actually used for nearly the length of time I would need to prove that, it's just a guess on my part. The locomotive was considered a complete failure, and it was sold to the Portland and Rochester Railroad, who immediately replaced those polygonal wheels with regular round ones. It was still held back while the wheel arrangement, so it was set to the Manchester Locomotive Works for reconstruction as an eight-wheeler. It didn't last into preservation, and onward was cut up for scrap in 1905. The British Rail 10100, otherwise known as the Fell Diesel. This diesel is not called the Fell Diesel because of its being bad, although kind of was. The Fell was named after Lieutenant Colonel L. F. R. Fell, who was one of the designers of this locomotive, and this is a diesel, but it is so weird. I'm going to try to explain it, and I hope you can follow me, because this isn't a diesel electric nor a diesel hydraulic. This is a diesel mechanical, which is a very rare thing for me to be able to say. It was constructed in 1951, built by LMS and Derby Works. British Rail, in their defense, only kind of inherited this. The merger took place over the planning phase, so the project was already in motion when British Rail took over. They really had nothing to do with its creation, but it uh, should have set the stage for how diesels would go for them is what I'm trying to say. The Fell contained six diesel engines total. Four of them were used for traction. Two were auxiliary engines and those ones drove the pressure chargers for the main engines, and the purpose of that arrangement was to enable the main engines to deliver very high torque at low crankshaft speed. That sounds ridiculous, and it is. Each of the four main engines was connected to the gearbox via a hydraulic coupling, which could be filled with oil to transmit power or drained to disconnect that engine from the transmission. The engine outputs were combined in pairs by two sets of differential gearing, and the output shafts of these two gear sets were then combined by a third differential gear set to drive the main output shaft. That, on its own, could actually cause the drive mechanism to lock up if the locomotive were to be pushed backward, so a vacuum-operated clutch was included in the gear train. The effect was that the gear ratio between an engine and the output shaft depended on how many engines were driving the transmission. The gear ratio selection was accomplished not by changing gear at all, but by filling or draining the hydraulic couplings to connect or disconnect the engines for the transmission. With only one hydraulic coupling filled with oil and the other three engines disconnected and their respective input shafts to the transmission locked by the two-way clutches, the single engine drove the output shaft through an effective gear ratio of 4 to 1. With two engines, it was 2 to 1, with three, 1.33 to 1, and with all four, unity. So basically, the effective gear ratio of the transmission was the inverse of the number of engines driving it. Now already, I have confused a lot of you. And that's okay. Don't feel bad, because this is nuts. And I'm not even done yet. I am halfway through this explanation. There was no overall torque multiplication effect from selecting a lower gear. 
the 4 to 1 mechanical advantage afforded to the single engine driving in the first gear was cancelled out by the fact that there was only one engine operating. So the maximum output torque from the transmission was the same as was available in top gear with all four engines operating. So with the way the transmission worked, basically it didn't provide any means of matching the torque characteristics of the engines to the requirements of the locomotive. It didn't provide for an increased torque output at low speeds for starting in hill climbing. It served only to match the output speed of the engines to the requirements of the locomotive, which is definitely not at all the same thing. I assure you of that. So the way the felt compensated for this was by altering the torque characteristics of the engines themselves. Now, in a normal, regular diesel engine, charge would come at a mass flow rate proportional to its rotational speed. The faster it rotates, the more charge it can aspire. And this leads to a power output in a curve, which rises more or less linearly with rotational speed until various limiting factors become significant. But the Fell didn't do that at all. The four main engines received their charge from Root's blowers, driven by those auxiliary engines that I mentioned earlier. They were governed in a way that when the traction power demand was more than minimal, they operated essentially at constant speed. The Root's blower is a positive displacement device. That means that the mass flow rate at which charge was delivered to the main engines depended not on the speed of the main engines, but on that of the auxiliary engines. So the power output of the main engines was essentially defined by the speed of the auxiliary engines. And since their speed was constant, the main engines had a power curve which was constant with rotational speed. Since power is the product of torque and rotational speed, the main engines were endowed with a torque curve inversely proportional to speed, producing maximum torque at a low speed and reducing as the speed increased. Thus, the necessary increased low speed torque output for starting in hill climbing was provided. That's great and all, but why did you have to make it that? What? That's insanity. Everything about this is way more complicated than it ever had to be. I get this was still early in diesel development and yeah, they were experimenting, but okay, look, EMD had been making diesel electrics for multiple decades. Did you not consider looking into that or Germany's diesel hydraulics or anything but this? Because that was the Fell's biggest problem. It was way too complicated for its own good. It worked in such a weird way. The maintenance men that worked in the United Kingdom at that time already didn't have a lot of experience with diesels in general, let alone something that would have been completely alien even in a country that did have experience with diesels. When it worked, it had okay power output and at a maximum speed of 84 miles per hour, but this was never going to be a running thing. This was never, ever, ever going to be something that would be mass produced in any way, because I don't think anyone's ever attempted anything like this before or since the fell. The 10100 also proved all this by having its first malfunction within a year of its initial service life. A loose bolt fell through its gear train and that damaged its gearbox severely. It was out of service for a year after that, and British Railways was not interested in pursuing any development further, even though they were looking on improving this ridiculous design. They did still fix the 10100 and kept it around until the 16th of October 1958, until it did what I repeatedly ask locomotives just never to do, caught fire, its steam heating boiler specifically. They didn't bother fixing its damage this time, it was returned to Derby Works where it was stripped for parts and then was finally scrapped in July of 1960. 